Okay, so uh, let us talk about uh, micro reactors. Uh, micro reactors are small size uh, devices um, where the reaction takes place in a narrow confinement uh, in a channel typically of size less than 100 micron. Okay. So, uh, you know the applications of micro reactors can be into uh, production of uh, chemicals and they can also be used for analysis of chemicals. Okay. So, we are talking about uh, micro reactors. And these are uh, devices in which chemical reaction takes place in narrow confinements. and typically they have size less than 100 micron and uh, their applications into chemical production and chemical analysis. Some of the advantages of micro reactors and they are uh, energy efficient, the energy efficiency is higher and the reaction speed is faster because of the smaller size. The yield, the space time yield as we will be talking about is much higher as compared to conventional reactors and safety is much better and reliability and scalability aspects are much better in micro reactors. Okay. So, let us look at uh, few characteristics of micro reactors. The micro reactors have uh, smaller size okay, and uh, larger uh, surface area to volume ratio. So, they would benefit in terms of uh, several advantages one will be you know since uh, the surface area to volume ratio is high the reaction speed is much faster. Okay. The thermal inertia is much lower and uh, the temperature uniformity is going to be much better. Okay. So, some of the advantages in terms of uh, the functionality are small thermal inertia short residence time and faster reaction uniform temperature Okay. Then there are advantages in terms of uh, safety okay. because we are talking about uh, you know small size reactors uh, if there is any leakage only small amount of small volume of uh, reactants will be ejected. Okay. So, the safety aspect is much higher as compared to conventional reactor. And also it is possible to integrate sensors within micro reactors. So, that also bring in some additional safety aspects. So, safety aspects because of the small size, small chemicals released, accidentally and uh, the sensor integration possible. Okay. So, that sensor integration also increases the safety. Okay. And the third aspect is the cost. So, 
So, since micro reactors can be batch fabricated the cost is less and uh, also the reagent cost is going to be less and rapid screening of multiple reactants possible. Okay. So, the rapid screening possible and one scientific uh, merit is that in micro reactors uh, the flow is uh, laminar because of the lower length scale and since laminar flow is much better understood uh, you know the micro reactors can be easily analyzed they can be analyzed using you know uh, theoretical models they can be analyzed using CFD codes in a much better way. So, the scientific merit is that the fluid flow is laminar. Okay. Now, let us look at a uh, few specifications of micro reactors. We look at uh, specifications. One important uh, specification is that uh, these micro reactors work on continuous flow basis, meaning the reactants uh, flow as they react. Okay. So, what it requires is that there should be enough resident time for the reactants to react with each other. Okay. So, the residence time is, is an important uh, specification in case of micro reactors. So, one important uh, specification is the mean residence time so tau residence is going to be l divided by u okay so this is the reactor channel length and this is the average velocity. Okay. We can find out uh, the reaction time depending on how the reaction is happening. The reaction time is if it is because of heterogeneous reaction then the tau reaction is going to be d h square divided by 4 d into s h. This is the hydraulic dia and this is diffusion coefficient and this is called Sherwood number. And the Sherwood number is defined as this is the coefficient, sorry, the subscript yes. is convective mass transfer divided by diffusive mass transfer. Now, in case of uh, a case where the reaction uh, depends on reaction rate, then in that case we can write down the expression for tau reaction as d h over 4 into k s. Okay and uh, k s is the surface reaction rate. Okay. Now, uh, in case of homogeneous reaction, in case of homogeneous reaction, tau reaction is going to be 1 over k v and k v is the the volumetric reaction rate volumetric 
reaction rate. Okay. The other specification is the reaction rate. So, this basically determines the flux of products. Okay. And typically in micro reactors the reaction rate is 10 to the minus 6 mole per second meter square. Okay. And uh, the Serud number uh, mathematically it is so it basically convective uh, you know as you have defined is the convective mass transfer divided by the diffusive mass transfer. So, it is k t into d h hydraulic dia divided by diffusion coefficient and here k t is the convective mass transfer coefficient. Okay. Now, as you can see as the channel size as the channel size decreases if you look at the reaction time a channel size decreases the reaction time is going to reduce okay Okay. So, if you are talking about smaller and smaller micro channel the reaction time is going to reduce, but at the same time as the channel size reduces and we are trying to maintain the same throughput the flow velocity will be increasing and if the flow velocity increases the residence time is going to reduce. Okay. So, what ideally we would need is parallel multiple channels so that the throughput can be you know coming from all those smaller channels at the same time it provides enough residence time inside and the reaction time is also reduced. Okay. So, our channel size is reducing the reaction time is reducing, but the reduction in channel size also needs to increase in mean velocity. And with increase in mean velocity, we get the mean residence time reduces. Okay. So, a characteristic of a good reactor will be that the reaction time is reduced, but at the same time the mean residence time needs to be maintained to a minimum, okay, so that it has uh, the reactants get enough time to mix with each other. So, that is at a fixed throughput okay okay fixed throughput of a single channel now if you reduce if you divide this channel into multiple parallel channels so that the reaction time reduces but at the same time the mean velocity remains the same because we have divided q into the total flow rate into different sub channels, then we can reduce reaction time at the same time we can have some minimum residence time. So, one approach to do that is to use parallel channels, okay, parallel channels in micro reactor. Okay. And, uh, for that reason the typical micro reactors will have many such parallel channels to get a significant amount of throughput at the same time with a reduced reaction time and some minimum residence time that is required. Okay. So, the next uh, parameter that we define is uh, the characteristic time of heat transfer. Okay. So, the characteristic time of heat transfer which can be defined as so tau thermal is going to be rho C p into d h square divided by 4 into thermal conductivity into, into 
Nusselt number. Okay, where Nusselt number is h dh over k. K is conductivity, and this is heat transfer coefficient. Okay. Now, here uh, since we are talking about uh, micro reactors, the surface to area, uh, surface area to volume ratio is going to be high, so the heat transfer is going to be much better. Okay, and uh, you know if the heat transfer uh, time scale is going to be larger than the reaction time scale, then there could be chances of explosion. Okay, so you know we are talking about micro reactors so we are talking about high surface to volume ratio okay now so that means increased heat transfer okay now if you have the tau thermal greater than tau reaction then there is a chance that explosion may occur okay so uh, we should take care such that you know to prevent thermal explosion the tau reaction has to be greater than tau thermal okay now the other important parameters to specify is the reaction temperature and the reaction temperature is uh, dictated by the activation energy of the reaction Okay. So, it depends on the activation energy. Now, the other parameter is the space time yield, space time yield. The space time yield is defined as the amount of product N divided by the volume of the reactor. Okay, in divided by the residence time. Okay, so this is the amount of product. This is volume of reactor, and this is residence time. The typical uh, space time yield of uh, micro reactors. is about 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 5 mole per hour meter cube okay and uh, the space time yield of micro reactor is about 2 to 3 orders of magnitude higher than the conventional reactors okay so this is about 2 to 3 orders of magnitude higher than conventional reactors okay now let us uh, look at some of the important functional components of a micro reactor so now let us look at the functional elements of a micro reactor so the different functional elements so we'll have a micro channel okay and we would have a mixing channel where the reactants will mix and we'll have heaters and temperature sensors
then we will also have electrochemical sensor to monitor the reaction and we would have catalyst so which will initiate the reaction. So, these are some important elements of a typical micro reactor. Now, let us uh, talk about uh, the design steps how we approach and design a reactor. The first step is to determine the channel size and this can be done by using the characteristic reaction and heat transfer times. Okay. So, we ensure that the reaction time is greater than the heat transfer time and determine the channel size and from the channel size we determine the the residence time. Okay. So, after we determine the residence time the third step would be to determine the channel length accordingly to determine channel length from the residence time and the flow velocity which will come from the throughput. Okay. Then the next step would be to determine number of channels, determine number of channels, number of channels which will also come from the throughput. Okay. Now, one important uh, parameters in the design is that the tau thermal has to be less than tau reaction as we discussed earlier to prevent explosion and or in the limiting sense the tau reaction can be greater than or equal to tau thermal and this is to prevent chain reaction. prevent thermal explosion. Okay. So, uh, with that uh, let us move on and uh, talk about uh, a micro fuel cell. Okay. A fuel cell as we know it a device uh, that converts chemical energy into electrical energy okay. and uh, a fuel cell does that at room temperature. Okay and uh, micro fuel cells are miniaturized versions of fuel cells and with maximum uh, power capacity less than 5 watt. Okay. If you look at here this talks about a typical fuel cell what happens uh, in a fuel cell. Here uh, the hydrogen is the fuel which comes in to the anode side and uh, the hydrogen uh, at the anode uh, breaks into uh, H plus uh, protons and electrons okay. and uh, these anodes are porous they are porous electrodes. So, the protons uh, are easily created at the anode and then here there is a membrane which is called proton exchange membrane okay. uh, or uh, they can be polymer electrolyte membrane. So, this proton exchange membrane basically uh, allows the proton to pass through and the proton pass through the membrane and at the cathode side we have oxygen coming and at the cathode the proton combines with oxygen to give water. Okay. So, that is what happens at the cathode side. Alternatively methanol have also been used as fuel. So, here methanol and water go, uh, go in and uh, methanol 
will break into carbon dioxide and proton, proton will pass through uh, the membrane and on the other side it will combine with oxygen to produce water. Okay. So um, you know we talk about uh, fuel cell, we talk about micro fuel cell. And the principle of operation of micro fuel cells are similar to that of a fuel cell and the applications are into different areas uh, for example for micro electronic components. and into smartphones. Okay. So here uh, as you said uh, the proton passes through the membrane, but what about the electron? The electron goes through the external circuit to produce electricity. Okay. So the any load can be taken uh, using the electron that is flowing through the external circuit. Okay. So if you look at uh, the electrochemical reaction. look at the electrochemical reaction. So at the anode we have the hydrogen breaking into proton and electron in presence of a catalyst and uh, at the cathode side you would have the proton combined with oxygen and uh, that would give to H2O. Okay. So the net reaction, the net reaction would be 2H2 plus O2 giving rise to water. Okay. So the, this uh, proton goes through the membrane, combines with oxygen and gives water and the electron basically goes through the external circuit and provides electricity. So this is the case where hydrogen is the fuel, okay, S2 as the fuel and we can have methanol fuel cells also. In methanol fuel cell we would have similar reaction at the anode CS3OH plus H2O will get into carbon dioxide plus 6 H plus 6 E minus and uh, the proton will combine with uh, the oxygen to give rise to water. Okay. So the net reaction, so this is at cathode, the net reaction is CS 3 OH plus 1.5 O2 will give CO2 plus H2O. Okay. So uh, you know micro fuel cells, uh, they the the principle of operation is uh, uh, you know same as that of uh, the conventional fuel cell. The only difference is that instead of going for larger channel structures, fuel distribution channels, we are going for miniaturized uh, version of the fuel distribution channels and the overall structure of the fuel cell and uh, the maximum power that could be delivered by micro fuel cells are less than typically 5 watt. So here we uh, employ the semiconductor fabrication technology, MEMS technology to fabricate the fuel cells thereby reducing the cost, increasing reliability and uh, increasing the functionality of the device. Okay. So, the micro fuel cells uh, combine MEMS fabrication with microfluidics technology and the typical power is less than 5 watt. 
okay. So that is uh, the typical power capacity. So with that uh, let us move on and talk about uh, PCR polymer polymerase chain reaction. Uh, we can fabricate small micro PCRs for analysis of uh, DNAs. So PCRs uh, have different applications they can be used for uh, you know DNA fingerprinting to identify the fingerprints. They can be used for diagnosis of uh, diseases. Now, before we talk about PCR, let us try to understand what DNAs are. Okay. So, if you look at here, so this is how a typical uh, DNA molecule would look like. Okay. So, this is a DNA structure of a DNA, and uh, it has typically two uh, long polymers of units called nucleotides okay so these units two long polymers are made out of uh, nucleotides okay and uh, the backbones uh, is made out of sugar okay so the sugar phosphate is the backbone and uh, these phosphates are joined by ester bonds okay so these are joined by the ester bonds and each sugar is attached to one of four nucleotides okay so you know so this nucleotides each of so the four nucleotides are adenine then guanine then cytosine and the thiamine A G C T. Okay. So uh, you know as you can see here, so these are the nucleotide uh, base pair: adenine, thiamine, or guanine, cytosine. Okay. So it is the sequence of these four nucleotides along the backbone so a g c t so these four nucleotides their sequence along the backbone is what encodes the information okay so the sequence of these four nucleotides is unique to a dna which is unique to certain individual okay so by looking at the the nucleotide uh, structure along the backbone of the DNA we could be predicting which uh, individual it has come from or it can also predict uh, presence of any disease. Okay. So, these sequences can also predict uh, presence of a particular disease. Okay. So, with that understanding uh, let us talk about what we mean by PCR. Okay. So, we talk about the micro reactor for polymerase chain reaction or PCR and so the PCR what it does is it takes a you know single strand of DNA or few strands of DNAs and in it amplifies to thousands or millions copies of DNA. Okay. So, even, even if with a small amount of sample that we have collected, we will be able to generate enough copies of DNA to be able to detect it. Okay. So, the PCR process, okay. so it is known as polymerase chain reaction. So, this enables so, it amplifies few copies of DNA into thousands or millions of DNA copies okay, of a particular 
DNA. Okay, and the applications are the applications are into identification of fingerprints. So, which has uh, relevance in forensic application and it can also be used for diagnosis of infectious diseases. Okay. Now, let us look at what are the components uh, and reagents that we need for the PCR process. Okay. So, components and uh, reagents for PCR. We would need the DNA template. Okay. So, the DNA template is the target DNA that we are trying to amplify. Okay. We want to increase the number. So, DNA template is nothing but the target DNA. Uh, to amplify and the second one is two primers which will basically hold the structure uh, these are complementary to the three prime the three prime ends of DNA target. Okay. As you know a DNA strand will have a 3 prime and 5 prime ends. So, we would need uh, a primer uh, that is equivalent to the 3 prime ends of a DNA strand okay. that is uh, you know complementary to a 3 prime end of a DNA target. Okay. So, as you can see here uh, the 3 prime end and we have 5 prime end. Okay. So, you need a primer which is complementary to the 3 prime end of a DNA target. Okay. And uh, the third thing we need is a tag polymerase uh, So, the polymerase the tag polymerase is the agent that start to build uh, the complementary strand equivalent to the single strand DNA using DNTPs. Okay. So, this is uh, the agent and the fourth uh, uh, step uh, that we uh, fourth element that we need are DNTPs okay. and these are the building blocks and from these building blocks the DNA complementary DNA strand is grown and then we need a buffer solution as an environment to do the PCR process. Okay. Now, what are the different steps of PCR? We will see the PCR steps. First step is called denaturing. During denaturing the DNA uh, the template DNA a, along with uh, the polymerase DNTPs are in a suitable buffer are heated to a temperature about 90 to 95 degrees. Okay. So, that the double stranded DNA separate okay, the two strand get separated. Okay. So, that is called denaturing where we heat at temperature get to the 90 degree centigrade or 20 to 30 second and this would break double stranded DNA into two complementary single stranded DNA. So, this is uh, shown here as you can see this is the denaturing process okay, which occurs uh, 
uh, at about 95 degrees centigrade and for 20 to 30 seconds. Okay. So, once you, the two DNA strands separate the second step would be to do the hybridization. And during the hybridization process the uh, elements PCR elements are cooled to temperature less than 60 degree centigrade. So, that each single stranded DNA six complementary strand okay. and the primers and uh, the tag polymerase binds to the single stranded DNA template and the DNA synthesis begins. Okay. So, what happens is after the denaturation the two strands will separate and uh, in hybridization the DNA strands will be cooled to a temperature less than 60 degree centigrade and each complementary DNA strand would look for its complementary uh, the double strand. Okay. So, each strand will look for its complementary strand. So, in that case the tag polymerase and uh, the primers will bind to that individual strand and uh, the polymerase start using the DNTPs to grow the complementary strand for a for each of these individual strands. Okay. So, that is known as DNA synthesis and uh, once the DNA synthesis stands uh, starts we go for what is called extension or elongation. Extension or elongation. So, here in this case the double stranded DNA as the polymerase works the double stranded DNAs are formed and it extend okay, are extended by DNA polymerase using DNTPs. Okay. And uh, if you repeat the PCR cycle n times, then the double stranded DNA would increase 2 to the power n folds. Okay. So, if we you know as you can see here, so this is denaturing this is the hybridization this is suddenly cooling down to 60 degrees. So, this is the hybridization process then increasing back to 75 degree 70 to 75 degree and then holding it for some time this is the extension phase. So, denaturing hybridization and extension this finishes a cycle okay. and if this cycle is continued uh, n times okay, then we would let us say we start with uh, you know uh, some number of uh, DNA x then by doing n cycles the number will increase 2 to the power n fold. Okay. So, the amplification factor we can define something called an amplification factor and this amplification factor gamma can be 1 plus efficiency of PCR cycle n to the power n. Okay. So, the DNA gets amplified by n times. Okay. So, E PCR is the efficiency factor and this is going to be 1 if number of cycle is than 20 and the value will reduce if n greater than 20. Okay. So, with that understanding uh, now let us uh, 
take on a design problem where we will uh, you know design a PCR chip. Okay. So, this is uh, the example that is shown here we have a uh, special PCR reactor that has flow channel edged in glass. The channel depth is uh, 40 micron and the width is 90 micron. The flow rates range from 66 to 72 nanoliter per second. Now, we are interested to determine the dimensions of the reactor that is shown below here. And we assume that three temperature zones have the same width. Okay. So, these temperature zones have same width and the time ratio of denaturing, annealing and extension is 0.5 second, 5 second and 0.5 second. So, annealing is basically the hybridization that we just discussed. Okay. So, the first step uh, you know we are we can assume that the you know liquid uh, the sample has uh, property as that of water. So, we assume that uh, the density is that of water. So, 1000 kg per meter cube and uh, the specific heat is 4182 joule per kg Kelvin and conductivity is 0.6 watt per meter Kelvin. So, first we calculate the thermal capacitance, thermal capacitance C thermal will be equal to m c. So, l w d. So, that is the volume into density into c. Now, from there we can find the, so the thermal resistance we can calculate as h over k s square into rho c. Okay. h is the channel height. So, uh, from there we can find the thermal time constant which is R c which is given by h square rho c over k and this will be 40 into 10 to the minus 6 square this is the channel height 10 to the power 3 is the density specific it is 4182 divided by 0 0.6. So, that will be 0 0.011 second. Okay. And so, the smallest design would consider the maximum velocity. Okay. So, in that case the mean velocity can be q dot divided by w h. So, the flow rate is 72 nanoliter per minute 10 to the power minus 12 divided by w is 90 into 10 to the power minus 6 h is 40 into 10 to the minus 6. So, you will have 0 0.02 meter per second velocity. So, we can require uh, the time required through denaturing can be found. So, T will be equal to 3 tau thermal plus T denaturing. So, this will be equal to 3 into 0 0.011 plus 0.5. So, that will be 0 0.533 second. Okay. So, this is the time required for the denaturing process. So, from there we can predict the channel length. In the denaturing zone, the channel length L will be u into t velocity is uh, 0 0.02 meter per second and time is 0 0.533. So, that will be equal to 11 millimeter. So, zone width can be L over 2 as one turn is made. Okay. So, width equal w by 2 which will be equal to 5.5 millimeter. Now, the extension zone will have the same width. So, extension zone width also be 5.5 millimeter. So, the length of the extension zone will be u into t extension 
which will be 0 0.02 into the T extension will be 3 into 0 0.011 plus 5. So, that will be 100 millimeter. Okay. So, the number of turns number of turns can be found. Now, we know the length of the extension zone because u and t extension zone are known. So, extension zone width is known. So, number of turns will be n will be 100 divided by 2 into the width 5.5. So, that will be equal to 9 turns. So, the in the extension zone in the extension zone as you can see here. Okay. So, this is the extension zone in the extension zone sorry this is the this is the extension zone this is the hybridization zone. So, this is extension zone the channel will make 9 turns. Okay. So, channel makes 9 turns in the extension zone. Okay. So, that is uh, an example uh, that shows how you can design a micro PCR chip. Okay. So, with that uh, let us stop here.